Hello and welcome to the Scottish Football Show. Coming up, a Christmas Cup for Clemmel. Rangers will play Aberdeen for the first silverware of the season. Pies or Pyro? We've seen both in the last week, but can the latter be implemented safely? And will St Johnston fans be living on a prayer? Oh yes, we're halfway there. And I'll leave it at that. I am Andrew <laughs> Slavin, your host in this latest episode of the Scottish Football Show, where we as industry know-it-alls give our take on the game on and off the field. So joining me this week is someone you could describe as a bit mouthy. By that, I mean he is a football commentator. He's also an author. Andy Barge, how are we, pal? Hello, mate. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Mouthy, <laughs> but I'll be doing my best to steer clear of any controversy if, that, if those two can work in tandem. Oh, I love. I would like controversy. Please bring it with you, Andy. Please. <laughs> but also, uh, also on the program, program, podcast, show, whatever. He's a veteran of it. That's all that matters. Sporting a haircut, Philip Clement would be proud of. He's the head of creative at Melbourne City FC. Welcome, Finley Marks. Thanks very much. It's, I'm glad that we've got another high-profile baldy in the Scottish game now in Philip Clement because um, I know that I'm going to get some sort of baldy intro every week from you so <laughs> I, I, I just enjoy that I've got somebody who's uh, who's taken some ground I think for the <laughs> fe- fellow follically challenged people in the world <laughs> Andy how was how was your weekend? Quite a busy weekend I was doing a Kilmarnock Motherwell game yesterday Nice I enjoyed seeing Ennis Cameron, an old next door neighbour of mine, score the winning goal for Kilmarnock. Is that right? Yeah, which was quite fun. And then today I was doing Rangers Spartans women for the sports scene. So, yeah, a couple of games for me this weekend. Excellent. And Finn, what have you been up to, pal? Living in the future? Yeah. <laughs> it was actually quite a busy week unintentionally for, for us last week, um, working at Melbourne City because. It was looking like it was going to be a relatively straightforward week. And then we got the news on Tuesday night that they were, by mutual consent, releasing the manager from his duties. Uh, and first thing on you Wednesday morning... sacked? Well, no, it was mutual consent. It's not a sacking. Um, oh, right, okay. But that was Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, there was a new guy in place. So, uh, yeah, cool. the seat was still warm. And had to hit the ground running because his first game in charge was Friday night against Sydney FC, which Melbourne City won. First league win of the season, so that's good. Interesting point. There is a Scottish connection here. Thank fuck for that. The, <laughs> <laughs> the new head coach of Melbourne City is one Aurelio Vidmar. Can you guess who he's oh, related to? No. Tony. Yes, brother of Tony Vidmar. Both of them played for the Socceroos and... Uh, had quite distinguished cl- careers playing in Europe, but yeah, Aurelia is the new head coach at uh, at Melbourne City. Very nice chap. I've already done a so couple you've, of interviews. So you've been him. you've been talking to him about Rangers then. I actually I always try and not um, do too much small talk. I let people talk because they've got a, bit, a million and one conversations going on. If you're a new <laughs> coach coming in, but he mentioned he was like, "Where are you from?" Because he could tell from accent I wasn't local to Melbourne and. Uh, I said, oh, Glasgow originally. And he's like, oh, Glasgow. He's like, my brother actually played in Glasgow. I was like, oh, I'm very aware, Aurelio. I'm very aware. <laughs> <laughs> Scored one of my favourite goals as a child, but yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's enough of that. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Let's talk a bit more about Scottish football, starting with what we normally do. Um, it's funny because I didn't do last week. It's weird trying to get back into all of this again. But we do do funnies, don't we, Finn? So can you kick things up for us? Well, we do just in with Rangers very quickly. This is actually a story that came out, uh, it was about 10 days ago, but it was totally remiss of us to miss it off the running order last week because it's just such a brilliant story. It got picked up everywhere, but it's the one that everybody will see now. I just love it though. Um, There was a a Korean pop band, a (laughs) K-pop band, uh, by the name of Stacey, I think it is. Um, Anyway, they're on a bit of a world tour at the moment, or certainly a US tour, and they were playing... Uh, in Texas and of course they've probably tried to endear themselves to the local crowd by wearing the the shirts of the local sports teams in Texas Um, of course they'll have googled it and seen that the the very famous baseball team from Texas is the Texas Rangers Yeah. so they took to the stage (laughs) what they thought were Ranger shirts Texas Ranger shirts but they're actually 
beautifully vintage 96-97 Glasgow Rangers home shirts. <laughs> it was very nice to see them again because it's one of my favourite kits from growing up. You know the, the, the one with the embossed Rangers oh, yeah. logo and the I think of it as the, as the Loudrup kit because the first time they wore that kit was in the 96 Scottish Cup final and even though Gordon Jury scored a hat-trick it's known as the Loudrup final because it was like one of those <laughs> 10 out of 10 performances but yeah uh, I just thought that was quite <laughs> quite funny Does the fact that it's vintage make it even better or would it have been absolutely hilarious if they had like the Blackthorn Rangers kit on instead <laughs> That would have been more bizarre, wouldn't it? Yeah. There are some uh, some honkers from the last decade or so that they could have gone for. Thankfully, they went for something that's better. But I mean, like it's it's all the rage right now, isn't it? You know, the cult kit thing, and especially nineties kits uh, is very much part of fashion. Even if people aren't into football, you see a lot of people sporting tops of like I don't know AC Milan or or Barcelona or whatever back in the day. So yeah, it was nice to see that, that kind of shirt from Scottish football hitting it on the international stage. I uh, I really enjoyed. Um... Um, Friday night's Morton against Dunfermline, the match. But one of the best moments was when the TV cameras spotted that some Morton fan, clearly raging at being 2 0 down, had thrown their pie onto the pitch. <laughs> well, someone was so raging that they flung a pie onto the pitch to our right in the aftermath of that penalty extreme, incident. Extreme measures, Thomas. <laughs> Cost good money, that, that. That's going to waste right in front of us here. So the cameras had caught it perfectly. The thing is, it's not even half eaten. It looks like they've taken one bite and thrown it on, which is a total disgrace to leave. I feel as a fallen soldier right there. That is unfair, <laughs> but just quintessential Scottish football. I think what made it quintessentially Scottish football is not the fact that someone's throwing a pie on the pitch. That will happen, I'm guessing, most weekends in Scottish football. It's Probably. the fact that obviously because it was a televised game, they did a nice big juicy close-up of it. So it was mm. the only thing you saw on screen was the green <laughs> of the pitch So and, and this pie right in the middle of it, as you say, with a disgraceful amount of meat taken out of it. Um, but it's I'm thinking that would give you more body. So you probably got a better aim ah, if you got right. a, a less pie. If there was less of it, it would have just flabbed about the place <laughs> and it wouldn't have been too effective. Funnily enough, you're right, it's actually quite a creatively framed shot. Like, if you take off the graphics, it's a great shot. they could actually, like, animate next week's fixtures in Scottish football. <laughs> Celtic play Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> they just have the pie in the background. That'd 100%. be nice. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Do we have any other ones? The only other thing I saw definitely worth mentioning was from the, the midweek round of fixtures uh, at Easter Road, the, the Hibs Ross County game. Um, somebody took a <laughs> snap of the footwear that the linesman was wearing at Easter Road. I don't know how best to describe it. Um, school shoes? <laughs> I am looking at it now. They are, I think, the most bizarre pair of shoes I've ever seen somebody wear on football turf. <laughs> I can't get my head around what they are they've got the shape and the shine of school shoes but at the back they've got you know the kind of the tongue at the back of the shoe as well yeah. that kind of goes up your achilles a bit that are supposed to like help you put them on school shoes i don't remember them being on smart shoes so <laughs> i don't know if it's like a hybrid thing or whatever it is but they are a disgrace <laughs> <laughs> i think there's no other word for it andy mm. it's a total utter disgrace um, I suppose I should take this opportunity, um, hopefully we're still got listeners at this point, to say that you can catch more of this podcast uh, on any other platform that you listen to podcasts, but we are on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and even TikTok, because we're down with the kids. So tell your friends, all the support is absolutely class, but we'll get straight back to the football now, uh, and into some news. It's not it's good laugh on it. So I didn't find it funny. The big news that came out on Sunday night at nine PM is that St Johnston have announced a new manager. It's uh, it's Craig Levine, former Scotland and Hearts manager, very experienced man. I've read that he was well, I know he was recently advisor to Brecon City, where um Andy Kirk was manager, but he's now taken Andy Kirk to be his assistant manager at St Johnston. And it seems on paper like it could be a shrewd appointment, Andy. What do you think about this? You've, you've worked with Craig before, haven't you? Yeah, C Craig, first of all, I'd say that he's he's clearly embedded in Scottish football. So this is not like a stranger coming in that might be seen externally as some kind of risk. So when it comes to the players in the league, I don't think 
Craig Levine, given that he does a lot of work for sports scene, is going to have to swat up to familiarise himself with um, the players at St Johnson and the clubs in, around the bottom half of the table. I find him, as a person, quite engaging, funny. He's a funny person, kind with his time. So I think that the players, I don't know what he's like as a football manager, but if he's uh, if he approaches his relationships similarly, then people should enjoy playing for him, I would think. There were names doing the rounds, such as Robbie Nielsen, Neil Lennon. I think that they would have been wary of taking the St. Johnson job because I think that they will probably still have their eye on gigs in England, I would imagine. And I think if you were not to do well at St. Johnston, that takes you out of that pond. Whereas I think Craig Levine's at a stage of his career where he can do this. If it doesn't work out this season, it's probably not really something that will be seen narrative-wise as completely his responsibility because of the start to the season they've made, even though he does have enough time to turn it around. And it will be, whether he keeps them up or takes them down, it's, it'll be down to him. So I think this is a relatively risk-free move for Craig Levine as far as reputation goes, whereas I think there's probably more at stake for others who are muted. Well, yeah, exactly. That That's an interesting point. It's it's not a bad step for Craig Levine because he's got so much to fall back on. And he'll probably be, like Mar- Marvin Bartley is at Queen of the South, still do media duties mm. outside of his, his full-time job. We know from his interview, or what St Johnston have already released, is that Andy Kirk is going to take all of the training. But the risk here is on St Johnston's permanent stay in the top flight of Scottish football. So it, it seems to me like it's a, it's a sort of shrewd appointment. But he divides opinion, and it would be interesting to see, do you think that the, the fans will take to this? I know you're not a St Johnston fan, but do you think fans will be think that, or do you think they'll just be divided, the, the St Johnston fans? I, 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 St Johnston fans, as a support, I think are a very moderate group of supporters. I think he can be a bit of a Marmite character at times, but I think given his stature in the game and his experience and the the, the spells that he's had, particularly with Dundee United and both times with Hearts, I just think of the calibre of managers that were available and, and going in for the job, I think he's a, a terrific appointment. And I, I, in kind of the same way, maybe as Derek McInnes at Kilmarnock, hopefully this isn't kind of like damning it with faint praise but I think he's probably a manager that's potentially at a level slightly above the club that he's gone to but they've got then the potential to grow to a higher level I think with a higher level calibre manager we're Mm. seeing that in in little pockets with with Kelly certainly since McInnes has come in you know they came through the championship and they just about survived last season but then they've had a brilliant start to this season relatively speaking and I think for clubs that aren't traditionally challenging in, in cups and further up the league table like Kilmarnock and St Johnson to have that calibre of manager is actually a really good thing. I'm also wondering if part of it is that if Levine comes in and, and say this season doesn't go to plan and St Johnson do go down, well they've got a manager who I'm sure will be aware of that and has all the necessary experience as well to potentially bring them straight back up because the championship can be so difficult. Kind of in the same way that Jim Goodwin did with Dundee United last season, came in halfway through the season struggled to find the momentum to keep them up in the end but was able to reset over the summer Dundee United stuck with them and they they look like they're going to come straight back up like their form's been pretty strong so far this season in the championship so I wonder if that's part of the thinking as well again like St Johnson don't tend to be a club that are rash with decisions like this you know they tend to take their time and appoint a certain type of person who tend to be people that will be there for a number of seasons if they have success great if they get into Europe even better but it's that kind of um, mediating position round about the middle of the table I think is where they're expecting or hoping to be most seasons and I think in Craig Levine what you think of him on or off the field and personally he's in terms of experience a really good appointment to be striving towards that Mm. I think it'll be interesting. They've got games coming up for them are are probably in their favour as well. Motherwell on Tuesday night and then Ross County. So an interesting couple of games for Levine to get his teeth stuck into to start his career there. Elsewhere, Celtic Park was a little quieter uh, the weekend against St Mirren because anyone listening to this will probably know the Green Brigade, the fan supporters group, were banned from away uh, grounds, but they uh, that has now been extended to the home ground, Celtic Park. And this story is 
becoming a bit of a mess for Celtic guys. Um, lucky for them, things on the pitch are pretty good. Uh, but as a little bit of a background to this, Celtic uh, did have a statement um, saying the reason for this was because of an increasingly serious escalation of un- in unacceptable behaviours and non-compliance with applicable regulations. So many would assume this was kind of direct action uh, after d- displays of support with ba- uh, Palestinian flags and everything that's going over uh, and on in Gaza at the moment. But the club have kind of insinuated that there's other reasons to this, such as uh, the use of pyro during the Champions League game against Feyenoord. Uh, there was a supposed unsafe behaviour in the game against Motherwell, illegal access to Celtic Park for the game against Lazio um, and violent and intimidating behaviour towards uh, stewards during the recent trips to, trip to Hibs. But the thing is, with this whole story, Celtic have for a long time celebrated many fans groups, including the Green Brigade, and they sell things with the Green Brigade on them at Celtic Park Celtic Park themselves, you could buy Palestinian flags outside the ground for a long time. So it's a really bizarre situation, this. It's, I know, Finn, you're a Rangers fan, but there'll be many Rangers groups that may feel that if they step out of line, maybe Rangers might do a similar thing to what Celtic are doing to their fans. Is it a dangerous precedent to turn around to fans groups and say you're no longer allowed to come to our stadium? Do you think it's a bad message from Celtic Park. I think so. I mean, we talked about this when the news came out a couple of weeks ago that they were banning them from away matches only. And now they've obviously gone the whole hog and banned them from home matches too. I think it's dangerous on a number of fronts. Uh, the first one of which is that you, you're kind of, it just plays into, I know we're going to come on to the whole chat about pyro and stuff later, but um, in a very explicit way, I think it demonizes a certain type of fan. And that mm-hmm. those are the fans that at games are more vocal, have banners and pyro and other things like that. Um, so it, it, it demonises them. And I, I just don't think that's a good look for a club ever to do. I, I also think, and I mentioned this in the show the other week, I think it kind of makes martyrs out of the Green Brigade, which all it really does is strengthen the position, I think, of the Green Brigade. Because I think in many ways they're being unjustly treated and it kind of makes the club look bad. And I know Celtic don't like having the reputation of the club made look poor so i i don't really I, I don't really get what the end game is like how, mm-hmm. how does this end do we just go on for a couple of months and then once it all dies down and it's okay for pr they'll let them back in like i, I don't really know where this goes does a group fraction and come back as different groups or re, re have to rebrand or rename I, I don't really know what the the end game is again laura went over this and it's it, you you can't just blanket blame one group for everything i think i think that's where it's most dangerous because there probably will be some behaviors that the green brigade have engaged in over, over not, not just this season but previous seasons as well with things like pyros or well, you know the, the clubs do get fines for that and there's there's maybe a conversation to be had there but also it's just it's part of the culture you're not going to stop people doing that so it just seems a bit unintuitive to me <laughs> to not enter into dialogue with people about this and try and have an adult Conversation and resolution to whatever the issue is. Um, True, but, but like, I think I think I think with that, Finn. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I think Celtic could turn round and say, "Well, we have tried to have that dialogue," and the Green Brigade may turn around and say, "Well, we've just completely disagreed and disregard." That's where the impasse is. There's no, there's no middleman. There's no person kind of orchestrating it. It's two organisations doing what they want, and for a long time, Celtic have almost put the Green Brigade on a pedestal for a long time. And this is now where... It's, I'm not saying that Green Brigade are in the wrong. I think both are in the wrong. I think there's a, there's an element where there's just... There's been a, 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 a huge loss in translation where there's no togetherness anymore. And there's, there's certain things that the Green Brigade don't like what Celtic leadership are doing. And therefore, there's a lot of the leadership that don't like to see what the Green Brigade are doing. And it's just, it is all I can put it down to is a complete mess. It's it's such a difficult thing to get right. I kind of agree with you. Just banning one group to kind of make a point just makes martyrs of the situation. It's just a complete mess. I, th- I think one other thing that's worth highlighting, and it's 
like all of these discussions that we have, whether it's about pyro or fan groups or whatever the situation is, VAR, whatever it is, people want a silver bullet. People want uh, one solution that will fix everything. And because these situations are so complex, that's very rarely the case. And I think um, even within the Celtic support, there will be people that are really annoyed um, and stand in solidarity with the Green Brigade and other fan groups for the way they've been treated. I, but I also know there will be fans that are quite happy that the Green yeah, Brigades have, have been sanctioned by the club for this because mm-hmm. I, I think you tend to find, and this isn't just a Celtic problem, it's not an old firm thing, this is like f- football wide, like because ultras groups and fan groups are certain pockets of fan groups, the ones that chant and everything, they bring a brilliant atmosphere but there's a lot of people, maybe a slightly older generation, that, that maybe aren't as big fans of it or whatever. So there, there's a bit of a, a conflict between those as well. Mm-hmm. So y- y- no matter what the Green Brigade do or the club do, no nobody's going to be entirely satisfied either way. But I think this this is the this is what I'm talking about, like adult conversation and adult resolution is that it's not a childish thing of just like one being punished and and the other person levying that power it's about people trying to find a compromise and you're right it, it's a real challenge but that is the inherent challenge like they mm-hmm. have to find a compromise and a way to coexist where the maybe the board want certain behaviors or certain fan groups to behave a certain way and the green brigade want to behave a certain way that's that's contrary to that but that's everybody has to be grown-ups about this and try and find a way forward because it's just it, it impacts on the atmosphere at Parkhead. It makes martyrs of the fan groups. It makes the club look bad. Like there's just, it's just not a good situation for anybody. It's a lose lose, really all round. Football, by the hell. So Laura isn't with us this week, as you've probably uh, figured out. But we did get together earlier on to discuss a burning issue. Hmm. Pun. Uh, within Scottish football, of course, uh, in recent weeks, and here it is now. So after the incredible display by Rangers fans last week at Dundee, pyro has been a hotly debated topic again across our game. If you didn't see it, the entire away stand at Dens Park was filled with a red glow as around about 18 flares were lit across the section at the same time. It meant the game was suspended for about 18 minutes because it actually set off a fire alarm. It's a culture that's rife worldwide, quite celebrated worldwide too, but there are obviously and evidently still a lot of safety concerns surrounding it. So instead of the usual scare stories and uneducated debating that happens online, we want to move the conversation forward and look at whether safe pyro can ever be introduced. So we're joined now by Tommy Cordston or Kurston. Tommy, is that yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Cordston, love it. You're a Danish expert on pyrotechnics and you have invented T-Fontaine, a form of yeah. cold pyro. Can you just tell us about the product? Yeah, the product is very simple. It's uh, We are using, uh, of course, uh, another recipe than you use in the uh, in the, the hot flares. The point with the, the, the hot flares, the emergency flares, is that they have to give a lot of smoke and they have to give a lot of light. And that makes them so damn hot, about 1,200 degrees or something like that. And that's because the light you see at night on the sea, if you have an accident, a ship uh, break or whatever, the smoke you can see at daylight when the helicopters are looking for uh, survivors. So that's the reason why. But uh, on the other hand, as I got into this problems here, I, I also began to see that some of it may be also a, a storm in a glass of water or a, a bubble in a pint, if you want. Mm-hmm. Because the Süddeutsche Zeitung had an, uh, an a statistics, and I think it was 2017 it was about, where they had 54 registered incidents with pyro. And I can assure you that no one has died because then the, the, it would have been much a much different debate. So that didn't happen. So there's been 54 incidents in, in a season. And through that season, uh, I think it was 21 million people who have uh, went to, uh, to football in that season in the second and third Bundesliga. And that drove me to that conclusion that it must be a more dangerous to bicycle to and from the stadium than being in the stadium filled with fireworks. 
I also have understood that this, the greatest problem, that was very much what we talked about in Denmark, that it, it was that the smoke disturbed the game. And that's something with the broadcasting companies has as a, they can only put so many advertising minutes into it. Uh, and, and so the, the smoke really destroys that schedule. And that's, that's more, more or less uh, the reason for it in Denmark. So does your, your product, does that cancel out a lot of these issues? Yes, it does, because you have, unfortunately, and I don't appreciate that, I think it's it's stupid, where people have thrown these flares into into the field, the football field. And if a steward has to pick up such a thing, which is 1,200 degrees and can be very, very hot, that is not very nice. The tea fontaine has, simply has a plastic handle, and it doesn't get hot. And you can take a little beer or water or whatever and put into the flare and it, it, it distinguishes completely. And it's not very heavy. I think it's about 250 grams or something. So if, if I had to be hit by something, I would prefer t Fontaine. <laughs> and then you have uh, the flare. Which it's, uh, I know there's been debate. Is it 500 degrees or is it 250 degrees? It has actually been measured very, very carefully by the University of Marseille, they have made a report on it. Uh, it says that it's something of uh, it, it's something of the best which has been made of its kind. Uh, you know the fan organization Copa ninety. Yeah, I used to work for them. <laughs> Laura used to work oh, okay, for them, okay. Tommy. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, they made an interview with me the day after the world presentation at Brunby Stadium, and uh, then later on they made a video, and he actually puts a tea fountain through his hair. Look how high up I can hold it without burning my hand. A normal flare, this is completely impossible. Look at my hand going through this. It's not that hot. If I put it against my head, my hair doesn't light on fire. I, I didn't ask him to do that. Nothing happens. But we have to be very, very clear here. You also ha always have to be very careful with fire. It's, it's not uh, something to play with. You have to be very careful and safety always has to come first. But when that is said, here we actually have a product which is much, would I say, much less dangerous than anything else if pyro is dangerous. I mean, where does this compare in terms of the temperature of, say, a sparkler, which is a very common firework that people give to children? It's very close to that. And it's, it's a, a powder which is very different from gunpowder because it doesn't develop very much smoke. Cold pyro, it, it has a temperature and you have to be careful but it's a much lower temperature. So a lot of people have, have also said, I mean, I don't know if you saw the scenes um, with Rangers fans at Dundee. Uh, it's quite a spectacle, but the smoke that it created. You mentioned that this cold pyro doesn't create as much smoke, but the, the, the fear factor in the UK certainly is that, you know, this could affect other people with maybe asthma and breathing difficulties. Do you think that this could be a step forward? For people who enjoy pyro, is is are these issues not as um, dangerous with your technology? In Germany, they are always talking about what they call feinstaub, uh, very fine dust particles, and uh, you are walking around in them every day because of diesel engines and uh, petrol engines and all kind of stuff in 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 the cities. So, I I don't think that you can put pyro in a stadium on a death certificate. I'm sorry to say, I don't think so. I think it's a, a little overdriven because if you stood it in 24 hours a day, okay. The point is that you use it in free air mm -hmm. on the stadium, not indoors. It's not It's not for indoors. It's only for outdoors. And the problem with smoke in a stadium depends very much on the stadium because the experiments we did in Brøndby, I also used some time to look at how the stadium react because I'm quite sure that some changes could be made to a stadium so that the, the smoke more or less would disappear of itself. So there's a lot of opportunities for doing things. And uh, and I, I think it will come because uh, I think all this is about authorities uh, and authorities always, they don't like changes because then they have to, uh, they need to train their, their procedures and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. they want things, things to be as it always has been. That idea of... We have no way of regulating this, so we just don't want to entertain it at all. The reason why authorities sometimes are a little weird, it's of course because some people complain about a lot of things. And that's the reason why authorities are as they are, because they have to 
to, to look at all these complaints and, and sometimes they say, okay, then we have to stop that or do that or whatever, what, what case it is. Uh, it can be different, of course, what, it, what the issue is. But yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult question, but I think Code Pyro will come into the stadiums at, at, at a time because this fight cannot go on. No one get anything out of this. Yeah, it's, it's not going away. Tom, you mentioned in the trials with Bromby, and that was, what, around maybe six, seven years ago. What's happened since then? What is the kind of barriers you've faced since then? In in Denmark, now I have to be a little careful not be too rude to the authorities. <laughs> no, because I, I authorities are authorities and you cannot fight them. They will not go away. It's better to be a little nice and, and, and have some patience and wait and see what happens. But in Denmark, it happened so that Brunby sought a permission, a, a permit to do this. And uh, it was with my name on it because I'm the biotechnician. And then we, we went on with it. And everything went so fine. I'm always worried, worried up to such a, a thing is first time you do something with a product because what will happen and so on. But when I saw how Brunbus fans uh, handled this, all my fear disappeared because it was so controlled. Everything was in its place. They did a tremendous work. And also, when I look at, at what they did and how they handled it, maybe it's the, not the same everywhere. I don't know. But uh, in, in Brunby, I would not hesitate to give them fireworks if I was allowed by the authorities be, because it was so controlled and so well organized. So it can be done. The, the football associations, UEFA themselves, government, police, they're, they're all against it. And it feels like no matter what country you're in, they're not looking to be educated on this. But as, as we're all saying, it's not going to go away and the fans clearly want it. What is the next step here? How do we, how do we change the attitudes and the opinions high up and get this ball rolling again? Uh, I, I, I think, first of all, it's important that the debate goes on because the problems will not go away and they have to find a solution. When we did the project in Brandy, the Swedish Football Association went into it also and uh, they bought a, a little over a thousand tea fontaines in the different five different colors. And uh, so far, I understand it's done, it is standing somewhere in Sweden and has not been used because suddenly the police simply decided to close all work with it. And the rumor said it was because they were angry at some of the, this, this fan culture, whatever. But if that is true, I, of course, cannot. That was what I was told uh, by some people. But um, uh, I don't know uh, so much about Swedish football and football uh, things, so uh, I don't know if that's true. But uh, it, 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 there was an article in a newspaper, uh, and uh, it said that uh, the police had decided simply completely to, to lock down all work with the t Fontaine, not because it was dangerous or because they had f- f- found some faults or whatever, you, uh, something wrong, but simply because of uh, just shutting it down. And that is probably a good example about how authorities react to new things, unfortunately. But if you go back in time and see when the first trains began to run, uh, there actually was a law saying that a man with a red flag has to walk in front of the train to warn people that now the train is coming. <laughs> and it also was something like that with cars. New things take time to, to be on, introduced somehow. As I said earlier, it doesn't help to shout at people and they have to come to terms with the, the problems in the stadiums or whatever. And, and somehow I think it will come. I have heard that the German Bundestag has uh, made a law which prohibits some of the clubs in Germany to try out cold pyro. But I, I hope it will succeed. I hope it, it will be used and it can be used and it's safe enough to be used. And uh, I really has created this product because I think it's important to give new tools. Mm-hmm. I see, I see uh, as I always has described it, I, I see the t Fontaine as a new pencil to paint with. And now it's the fans who has to be the Monet and the Van Goghs. Tavernier. Oh, he scores! James Tavernier! And 
double from the captain that surely now takes them into the Barclay Cup final. We have our first National Cup finalists of the season. It will be Aberdeen against Rangers for the first time since like the early 90s. Absolutely mad. But we'll start with uh, Aberdeen's win over Hibs. And it was it ended up in a, a bit of a mad one, Andy. Uh, Majofsky scoring the only goal of the game after they had a man sent off. Yeah, one of the most blatant second yells I think we'll see all season. <laughs> and from then on, though, this is where I... I'm not a Hibs fan, so I hesitate to say that I worry for Hibs, but I observe about Hibs that they just like, seem to always lack a bit of backbone to get themselves through situations like that. And even... The goal, I think Levitt, and I can't remember who the other one was, the two players, they just completely dropped their concentration levels at a critical moment. And Majofsky is racing through. Brilliant striker. I think surely he'll be away from Aberdeen, if not in a couple of months in the summer. I think some people said that last season. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. And he's anyway, scored in a couple of goals in Europe as well, so he'll be putting himself even more obviously on the map, which mm-hmm. is which is great for him and Aberdeen will, will make a bit of money, I'm sure. But at, at that point, and even even Levitt is, when he's hunting down Majofsky in the box, he seems to put the brakes on as Majofsky is getting ready to shoot. Mm-hmm. I mean, that there, there must be some sort of, maybe Levitt doesn't have it, he's a ball playing centre mid, but there must be some sort of instinct to just get whatever you can in the way of that ball before Majofsky pulls the trigger. And I think that is just very symptomatic of what we've seen a lot from Hibs over the last decade or so, where it seems to be going their way and they knock their heads together to figure out a way to make it not so. It's it's called Hibsing it, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Hibsing it yeah. is the phrase that we've used for many years. But when, who, who was it? Was it Povara that had the ball in midfield and he, he was shoulder to shoulder with someone and the Hibs player went down? It was never a foul. It was just like a tussle for the ball. And Levitt and the other Hibs player, I can't remember. Might Was it Miller, maybe the right back? I can't remember. They just, for a split second, stopped their stride, looked to the ref and put their arms out as if to say, all right then, Phil. And yeah. in the blink of an eye, Majofsky's through and you just can't accept that in a national semi-final. That's so poor. At that level, you're absolutely right. It's not good enough. However, Hibs do have like a case for being pretty annoyed in this game with two clear moments of controversy. The Martin Boyle offside the penalty shout for Dylan Venta was a fair shout for a penalty and Neil Montgomery was pretty adamant it should have been given but these are the breaks that you sometimes don't get and you kind of have to keep plugging away and those things can happen to you you can't just look back on individual errors from a referee fair enough you've still got to win out on the pitch and that's what Aberdeen ended up doing you've got to praise Aberdeen for their mentality because I said before the game Last week, they tend to struggle after bad results and they had that heartbreak against Pauk in, in the Conference League. But fair play to them because they it was almost like the sending off galvanised them. They were even better and held out better for those final 12 minutes or whatever it was they had to do. So, yeah, f- fair play to them for getting to the final. Yeah, fair play, fair play to Rangers as well because they were pretty dominant in their game against Hearts. 3-1 that ended. A cracking goal from James Tavenier, Finn. But the... the both teams will be looking to the 17th of December to possibly lift the first trophy of the season. An interesting point you actually flagged before we started recording this, Finn, was that Hearts had actually never beaten Rangers at Hampden, uh, which is absolutely wild. I, I couldn't believe that fact. because, I, And my mind automatically went to, oh, what about the, was it the 98 Scottish Cup final? But of course, that Hampden was being redeveloped. So that was at Parkhead. So yeah, they've, they've never beaten Rangers at Hampden. And the other stat that blew my mind was um, obviously Lauren Shanklin scored the penalty uh, in, in the semi-final just there. But the last player to score for Hearts against Rangers at Hampden was uh, in the 96 Scottish Cup final. And, and that player was John Cahoon, who's 60 now. So it just shows you they've had a rotten run of... Was that uh, the Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola Cup? No, because it was a Scottish Cup final, so it would have oh. been the tenth Scottish Cup final. Coca Cola was the League Cup back then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good, good memories, good memories. Let's um, let's keep the roundups going. We'll go straight into the SPFL roundup. Celtic were emphatic winners uh, at Ross County, unmovable form at the moment, but they, they did have a little bit of help after James Brown was sent off after ten minutes. James Forrest rounding off a great day for the hoops, which was mad. A lot of people have already said it, but to score in 15 consecutive seasons 
is absolutely amazing, Andrew. Fifteen. Fifteen consecutive seasons wow. for Celtic. Is that how long Forrest's been going for? Oh my yeah, god. Yeah. It's about right. <laughs> that is that is an impressive start. Especially for someone as well. I know he's played for a team that dominates possession every other week and scoring goals for fun. But he's been injured for quite a lot of time over the years, James Forrest. So I think to find himself in the score sheet at least once every season, I have to pay him his dues for that. Andy, you were in commentary in the commentary box, weren't you, for uh, Kilmarnock Motherwell. A big, big win for Kilmarnock. It moved them up to fourth in the table. And as you said earlier on, your old neighbour, Ennis Cameron, scoring. He came on for, for Vassell, who has been, you know, an excellent acquisition for Kilmarnock since he's came in, but a good a good sign for Derek McInnes to see someone like Cameron coming off and trying to make his mark. Yeah, because with with Vassell, when he, when he was signed especially in January, he looked like the sort of battering ram striker that would cause problems <laughs> for defenders without actually scoring so many goals. If you looked at his record over the years, it was never that prolific, but he's actually hit quite a hot streak, not just right now, he was Decent in the running for Kelly as well last season. So it is quite a void that's going to need to be filled at the moment because Kelly don't have somebody that can find the back of the net. And it was it was quite nice from a Kelly point of view. And this Cameron set up by young David Watson, two Academy graduates on the park. And yeah, as you say, I I've known Ennis for years and years and years. My family home's next door to his back in Trun. I gave him a wee message after uh, oh, on cool. Instagram just, just to say like congratulations. Um, it's quite cool to commentate on a Scottish Premiership goal from someone that I, I grew up next door to. So yeah, pleased for him. And just went on on that run of form for Motherwell after such a good start to the season. It's weird how quickly things can change, isn't it? Really weird. Mad. And 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 from a Kelly point of view as well, started the season with wins over Rangers and then Celtic in the cup. And then Kelly went seven games without a win. All of a sudden, they've won three of their last four and, and look where they are now. It's it's so... The, the, the turnaround in fortunes can be so quick when all you need to do is string two or three wins together and your outlook completely changes. That that league table as well right now is 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 weird. I, I don't know how that's going to stay the same because the, the, the points difference, like you said, you can go on a three-match winning streak and be in completely different position and, and state of mind as well because that yeah. plays that plays a big part on players, players' heads going into games. But it is a shocking run, Finn, when you look at Motherwell. Seven matches without a victory is, is dreadful. Yeah, I, I, especially contrasting that with how good they were at the start of the season because I think they took 10 points from the opening 12 available in the league. It was three wins and a draw from their opening four games. And since then, in the seven matches, they've only taken one point. So mm-hmm. that's a pretty drastic fall off. And also, you know, their their away form since Duke Kettlewell took over in February had been pretty decent up until I think they hadn't lost away until they played St Mirren uh, in the League Cup uh, mm-hmm. in August, but they've lost quite a few away games now, Rangers, Livy and, and, and now Kilmarnock. So a, a bit of a worrying run of form recently. Um, but like like you say, it, it can be combated once you get two or three good results under your belt, you can be back up the table. So yeah, I, I don't think they'll be in danger over the season, Motherwell. No. It's just it's a pretty disappointing run given how well he started the season. And uh, a good win for, well, another win for Dundee, who have had a good start to the life back in the, the Scottish Premiership. That is that is a good win. That is a good win, Andrew. I say that because it's a well-worn cliche, but those are the games that you have to win. You, you have to beat the teams that are expected to be around you. So if, if Dundee don't win at home against either of the old firm or probably... You, despite their current form, put Aberdeen and Hibs and Hearts and stuff in that bracket. Everyone else at home, Dundee really have to beat. And they have just been on a nice nice wee run. They're a perfect example of what we've been talking about. Tony Doherty's start to management looks absolutely fantastic. Right, Finn, shall we wrap up the, the lower leagues that happened over the weekend? I'll, I'll start things off with the Championship. We'll start with Friday night because it was quite uh, an eventful one at Greenock Morton. It was perfectly summed up their first half by SPFL Media Watch. He said, uh, B. Morton, 2 0 down after seven minutes, a pie thrown on the pitch, and a player storming down the tunnel after being subbed after 20 minutes, and then chance of sacked in the morning after half an hour. <laughs> Amazing. The game ended 2 1 to Dunfermline. <laughs> uh, it, it was absolutely class. I, I just loved the pie thing. But yeah, and Capelo is always, always good value for money. Um, elsewhere, I suppose the, the, the other result that stuck out to me was the fact that Cali Thistle are still unbeaten. 
and the Duncan Ferguson. Um, they drew against Dundee United, 1-1. Cali remained ninth in the table, so it's uh, in his first four matches, it's two wins and two draws. But those matches, some of them have come against Partick Thistle, Airdrie and Dundee United, who have all had pretty decent starts to the season. So coming out of those unscathed, I, I think it's a pretty good platform for Big Dunk to build on there for the rest of the season. Yeah, interesting. Obviously, Dundee kind of really running away with it up in the championship. And there's a gap as well. I think Wraith Rovers in second. There's like yeah. 10 points separating them in fourth place. It's absolutely unreal. But nevertheless, it's always still a challenging league. League One, Hamilton, guys, they've succumbed to their first league defeat of the season. They were away at Cove Rangers. Fraser Fivey with the only goal of that game. Falkirk did extend their lead at the top of the table to three points. But it could have been more if it hadn't been for the mighty Queen of the South. Um, <laughs> it's a good point for Queens, to be fair. It was 1-1 it ended. Uh, but they still fell down the table to 8th because uh, Aloha uh, were victorious 2-0 against Stirling. And another good result in League 2 for Spartans. They won away at Clyde who are struggling. But that's them on 20 points now. So they actually level in second place with Dumbarton. Um, both of those clubs just two points behind uh, the current leaders, Peter Heed. So a, a great a great debut season in the, in the league so far for the Spartans. No doubt buoyed on by their uh, vociferous... Uh, young team and ultras that, that do the TIFOs and everything down there um, mm-hmm. I, and the, the, the wrong end of the table I mentioned Clyde there they're, they're joint bottom of the table with Elgin who are also having a, a minging season I think it's fair to say <laughs> <laughs> both of them just on six points so far so uh, not looking great for either of them We should actually say uh, we don't draw huge amounts of attention to it but the fact that Brecon City have lost their manager Andy Kirk to, to go and be the assistant at St Johnston with Craig Levine Brecon are still actually the only undefeated team in the Highland League so they're, they're currently second with eight wins and one draw for Martin United are leading that league at the moment and equally down at the Lowland League East Kilbride are still the only unbeaten team in the Lowland League as well mm. but they're top of the table too so always interesting to see who are the runners and riders are uh, at that level so it should be one to keep an eye on Finn. Right, well, that's it for another episode. Happy days. We can move on and look forward to next weekend. Andrew, thanks. Or I should say, Andy, yeah. thank you for your well, company. Um, only my mum calls me Andrew. <laughs> Finn, legend. Thanks, man. Thanks, mate. Cheers. That's really good. Tommy Curson, <laughs> he was class. Absolutely eccentric scientist, pyrotechnic that he is. Time for that old saying. Go and listen to something else now. Bye. <laughs>